anxiety, loneliness, worry. Everybody struggles with something. If you're not struggling with something right now, just wait, you will. But there doesn't need to be shame when you're struggling with your mental or emotional health. It's okay to not be okay. God knows when you're going through it, but he doesn't want to leave you there. We want to make this a safe place to talk about life's challenges, to help people find support and healing. Around here, we say welcome home all the time because every piece of you is welcomed, the healthy and the hurting. Fear, depression, loss. This is the type of stuff we don't talk about, but we probably should. Hey, good morning, Christchurch. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, I love the warm greetings. It's awesome. Well, my name's Andrew, and I serve as one of the worship pastors here at Christchurch. I'm so uh, grateful to be with you this morning to share God's Word with you. Um, before we dive into God's Word, I do just want to share with you an, an announcement, a greatest gift offering update. Uh, the greatest gift offering is an offering that we have at the end of every year where we give over and above our tithes and offerings um, in a really big gesture towards God to say, Lord, we trust you with this. We're going to give this to you, and we just can't wait to see how you move in incredible ways. And Christ Church gives all the money from the greatest gift offering away to ministry partners. And one of those ministry partners is a ministry partner called Frontier Partners International. And they're doing some amazing work over in Lebanon right now. And we helped meet a really practical ministry need there. They've been in need uh, of some wheelchairs for a while in uh, Lebanon. And they also needed a shipping container to bring the wheelchairs to Lebanon. And so another supporter of Frontier Partners uh, was able to get the wheelchairs. And they still needed the shipping to containers, a 40-foot steel shipping container. And uh, we had the opportunity to partner with Frontier Partners and purchase these shipping containers that the wheelchairs would go over in because they had a vision to take that 40-foot steel shipping container and repurpose it into a training facility for ministry there. And so we were able to uh, partner with them to make that happen. And so because you give, we were able to give $11,500 for the purchase of that shipping container. So that Frontier Partners International can do amazing work in God's kingdom in Lebanon. And so I just want to take a moment to just say to you, when, when we give family, it's an opportunity uh, to, for God to do more with the offering that we bring than we can imagine. He's expanding his kingdom all over the world, and you get to be a part of that right here in Wichita because of the ways that you give. And so I don't know what your giving journey is right now, but if you haven't, if you call Christ Church your church home, I, I encourage you, take a next step and start giving. Uh, it's amazing to see how God works in and through uh, the finances that we give to the ministry, and then also the ways that God works in our heart as we release those things that he has first given to us. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so I just want to encourage you with that. God is at work all over the world, and you are a part of that. Family, before we dive in today, I'd like to pray. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning uh, with grateful hearts. We acknowledge, Lord, that you are great and powerful and mighty, that you are life, that you are love, and Lord, that you um, have been so good to us in so many ways. And that's why we're here today, Lord. We're gathered together to hear from you, to know you more. And so we're going to step into this message series, and we've been covering some heavy topics. And we just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would minister to our hearts as we um, discuss loneliness today. We know, Lord, that you are here with us, and we're so grateful for that. Lord, I am a man, and I need your help. Help me to preach your word responsibly, and may you receive all glory from this. We love you, and we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, family, uh, we are coming to the final Sunday of our sermon series called Stuff We Don't Talk About. 
And in this series, we've been covering some painful and difficult feelings that we experience. We've talked about anxiety and worry. We've talked about fear. We've talked about depression. And then we have gone to God's word to see what God has to say about these things. And I have really appreciated the conversations that I have had and overheard (laughs) during the course of this series. Uh, I think that God is doing some amazing things in our time in these topics. And today we're going to finish our uh, sermon series by covering the topic of loneliness. Um, I want to start out by giving a definition of loneliness. And it's going to be up here on the screens that you can see as well. Loneliness is mental or emotional discomfort from a felt gap in our desire for connection and our actual experience. I'll say that again. Mental, emo- mental or emotional discomfort from a felt gap in our desire for connection and our actual experience. See, family, I want to start out by saying that we were created hardwired for connection to God and to one another. We were created hardwired for it. In the Garden of Eden, we see that Adam and Eve experienced intimacy and community with God and with each other. But then we read in Genesis chapter 3, recording the fall, how when humanity stepped out in rebellion and chose to go their own way, they experienced alienation from God and from one another. And ever since, people still have this need and desire for connection, but sometimes we feel a gap or distance in our experience. Have you felt that? Where we can be sitting in a crowded room and still feel completely alone. Have you felt that before? Maybe you're feeling that now. The effects of loneliness are only getting increased attention recently. They've been there all along, but they're really getting noticed a lot more after the pandemic. Last year, loneliness was called an epidemic by the Surgeon General of the United States. Uh, a A poll that was released in 2024 found that one in three people report being lonely once a week, and one out of 10 people report be feeling lonely every day. So if you take a cross-section of this room, maybe we've got 60 or 70 people in here. Uh, We'll call it 60 on the low end. That would mean that 20 people in here, according to that cross-section, would report maybe feeling lonely once a week, and six people in here would report feeling lonely every day. Two countries, the United Kingdom and Japan, have so noticed this issue that they've created a government position called the Minister of Loneliness, in order to combat loneliness in their countries. And ironically, loneliness is experienced while we're more digitally connected than ever. We've got social media. With all of this social media that we have available to us, one would think maybe we'd feel less lonely. But in our actuality, loneliness inverts it. It doesn't meet the social connection needs that we have. It only half fills them. And not only that, but it stokes within us feelings of uh, fear of missing out. We see other people having a good time, and then we just notice that we weren't there. And we feel lonely. And we're not seen and known as we're scrolling alone. Loneliness is a feeling that you have ex- may have experienced before, It may be a feeling that you are feeling right now, or it may be a feeling that somebody that you dearly love is walking through. It may be caused by pain or heartache that you don't think that other people will understand. It may be caused by ruptures in your relationships. Maybe when uh, I I was just thinking about, I had a conversation with somebody this week who was saying, you know, when they got sober, they stepped away from their friends who were still stuck in addiction, and when they did that, they felt super alone. 
And then maybe loneliness is also caused by areas of hidden sin in our lives that we feel like if we reveal those to other people, they will reject us for it. Or it could be a combination of these or other factors. However you felt it or are experiencing it, loneliness is a common experience even among the people of God. And today we're going to look at a case study of this through the life of Elijah the prophet. If you guys want to, we're going to read an account of Elijah from 1 Kings 19. So if you want to turn there or tap there on your devices, we'll be there in just a second. But as you're going there, I just want to give you a little overview of who Elijah was. Elijah was a prophet who served the Lord in the time of the divided kingdom. This is the time after King David and after King Solomon when the people of Israel had split into two groups Israel was up in the north, and Judah was down in the south. And Elijah was sent to speak God's truth to King Ahab of Israel, because Ahab was le- himself, he was practicing evil and idolatry, and he was leading the people of Israel into it as well. And so God did some amazing things through Elijah. Elijah prayed that it would not rain just so the people would see uh, their, the error of their ways, and then it stopped raining. There was a drought in the land of Israel. And then that drought caused a famine where eventually Elijah was sustained by God. And then when he went to a widow's house, God sustained Elijah and the widow through the course of the famine. And not only that, but God raised the widow's son back to life after he became ill. And then God showed up the false god Baal and 450 of his prophets through Elijah. And then Elijah prayed to God again, and the rain came down. Now, if anyone could claim to experience victory through God, it was Elijah. He did, he saw God do all of these amazing, incredible things. And James 5, 17 through 18 recounts God's work through Elijah. And it says this in James 5, 17 through 18. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. So, in context, James is pointing out that the prayers of a righteous person are effective, and he uses the story of Elijah as an example of that. But notice what James said right at the beginning of verse 17. He says, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He was a human, like we are. And so that means if he's human and we're human, he had his struggles too. When you think of Elijah, you might be surprised to hear that a prophet who had great faith and did amazing things in God's name would go through a period of loneliness and depression. I think that sometimes we can look at the people described in Scripture and we can look at the like hero stories in there and go, wow, they're amazing, super lovers of God who are just living that hashtag blessed life. <laughs> and, but the Bible is realistic about people and it doesn't shy away from telling about their struggles. And they're people like we're people. And they went through struggle like we go through struggle. And they needed God like we need God. So today we're going to be looking at this story from uh, Elijah's life in 1 Kings 19. And this is a story that is a window into his struggle and our struggle, into God's faithfulness to Elijah and God's faithfulness to us. So let's jump in. Y'all ready? Okay, 1 Kings 19. In the lead up to this in 1 Kings 18, God has worked through and with Elijah to defeat 450 prophets of Baal. So it's Elijah and God versus 450 prophets of Baal. Who comes out on top? God. (laughs) And he does this in front of King Ahab and the people of Israel at Mount Carmel. And then right after that, he goes and he prays and rain falls after three and a half years of drought. And so you can imagine that Elijah's probably riding pretty high at this point, right? (laughs) But then Ahab shares the news with his wife, Jezebel, and she is less than pleased. So let's pick up in 1 Kings 19.1. It says this, 
Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. So I'm thinking Elijah had thought at the beginning of this chapter, this will for sure be the turning point for Israel. Ahab and the people of God just saw God move in incredible ways. Things will have to turn around here. But then Jezebel threatens to kill Elijah, and he runs away for his life in fear. And while it was only Jezebel who threatened Elijah's life, Elijah's later going to confess his feelings that the Israelites as a people were trying to kill him. So Elijah felt like it was Elijah versus everybody else. And so Elijah and his servant find themselves singled out, alone, and on the run. And then Elijah decides to leave his servant behind, journeys another day, and then asks God to take his life. In the midst of these circumstances, Elijah's gone from a victorious mountaintop moment down to a lonely, languishing prayer under a bush. And one question came to me as I was reading this passage. I was like, why did Elijah leave his servant? You know, if, if you're in the midst of loneliness and depression and, and really going through it, at least having a buddy with you might make it a little bit easier, right? But Elijah's prayer in verse 4 is showing us the depth of his sorrow. He wants God to take his life. And in the midst of that dejection and despair and the felt social rejection from the Israelites, he's just feeling it at this point. Now listen, Elijah, just like James was saying, Elijah is a human like us. And in this moment, he was going through a painful time. His hopes had been dashed and he was feeling afraid and alone. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you're there right now. I know that I've been there. And in our pain, we can often cope in ways that are very unhelpful. And our experience of loneliness can increase with it. One of the ways that we can cope is to physically isolate ourselves. You know, we are going through it. We feel like maybe people won't understand. We feel like Maybe they'll reject us for sharing how we're feeling. And maybe that's because we feel that way because we've been rejected in the past. We've been burned before. And so then we physically isolate ourselves. We skip the Sunday morning gathering or don't go to life group. Another way that we cope is maybe we cope, (laughs) retreat from other people emotionally. We put up walls. We say everything's good. Somebody's asking how you're doing, like genuinely asking how you're doing, not like how you're doing, the greeting how you're doing. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, cool. But somebody says, hey, how are you? Everything's great. Everything's fine. And we miss out on being seen and known and loved in the midst of what we're experiencing. Another way that we cope is through distraction. We'll turn to our phones or TV or books or any other number of distractions to numb our pain and to escape, and as we're distracted in our screens or in our books or in whatever, we miss out on intimate connection with the people that are around us. And another way that we can cope is through busyness. You know, we'll retreat into busyness. We'll keep moving and keep working on things, and in our efforts to numb our pain, we turn to getting things done and being productive, and as we're doing that, we miss opportunities to be present and seen and loved by those around us. And I just want you to know, I've been there. I, I've, done each, I've coped in each of these ways. Am I alone in that? 
Okay. In each of these things and other examples, what's the result? Listen, remember at the beginning of the message, we talked about this reality, right? You were created, hardwired for connection and community. But all of a sudden now I'm perceiving a gap between my desire and con- for connection and community and my experience. Just like our definition at the beginning said. And all these ways that we go towards coping to numb our pain, we can increase our own loneliness. Here's the beautiful truth, though, family. Even when we're experiencing loneliness, God will meet you there. He will meet you there. God loves you. He sees you right where you are right now. If you're experiencing it even right now, God sees you. He hasn't abandoned you. He won't abandon you. He meets you right where you are. Look at how he ministers to Elijah. We're going to pick up in the second half of verse 5 and go into verse 6. So he's just laid down under the bush and fallen asleep. And then it says this, All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and he drank, and then he lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and he ate and he drank. And strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. Even in the midst of Elijah's loneliness and depression, the Lord is there with him. He cares for him. He ministers to him. He provides for his physical needs. God sustained Elijah through his time of loneliness and darkness and brought him to a place of encounter with God at Mount Horeb. Mount Horeb is also called Mount Sinai. And if you think back in the biblical story into the book of Exodus, this is where Moses and the Israelites met with God after God rescued them from Egypt. So let's see what Elijah's encounter with God looked like on Mount Horeb. Picking up at the end of verse 9, And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. And now they are trying to kill me too. So Elijah's encounter with God begins with the Lord asking him a question. Now here's the thing. God already knows why Elijah is there. When God asks a question, he's not trying to get more information. The question is aimed at getting Elijah to search and share his heart. And Elijah does. He shares exactly how he's feeling. He he shares how he has passionately served God but how the Israelites have turned against God and against God's prophets. And then he comes with his honest confession. He says, I am the only one left. I am all alone. And they're after me too. Elijah pours out his heart before God. He's completely honest with where he's at, and he doesn't mince words. And family, I just want you to know that you can be honest with God. God knows what you're feeling. You can tell him what you're feeling, exactly what you're feeling. If you read through the Psalms, it's a roller coaster, (laughs) y'all. Because people are, the the authors of the Psalms are being authentic and telling God where they're at. You don't have to come to God with this fake wall. He knows. He loves you and he sees you right where you are. So be where you are with God. 
And in response, God does several things with Elijah. First, God teaches Elijah about his presence. Picking up in verse 11. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Notice the expressions of God's power here, right? We see earth-splitting wind, powerful earthquake, and a fire. But also, did you notice what it said after each one? The Lord was not in them. And then after all these powerful things, what comes? A gentle whisper. And at the whisper, Elijah comes to the mouth of the cave for the encounter. And family, sometimes as we follow Jesus, I think that we can expect God's presence to show up in these really big and magnificent ways. And we can be waiting for the big sign or the for sure, no questions asked move of God. And to be sure, God moves in some big ways. Remember, right before this in 1 Kings 18, God came down in fire at Mount Carmel. He sent down fire on Mount Carmel and uh, just moved in powerful ways before Elijah and the people of Israel. And while he most certainly can move in the big things, he's also present in the small and the little and the ordinary. In those quiet morning car rides to work, or when you lay your head down at night right before you go to sleep, God is there. Even in those moments when you feel alone. God is with us. We just need to help. We just need his help to see it sometimes. And we can ask God to show us and he will meet us there. A second, after this encounter with God on Sinai, God resets Elijah. Picking up in verse 15. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu son of Nimshi king over Israel. And anoint Elisha son of Shaphat from Abel Mahola to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazael. And Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel. All whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. What we see here is God resetting Elijah. He's met Elijah here. Elijah has come to a place of encounter with the Lord and now God is going to speak truth to him in this moment. First, notice he gives Elijah a mission. He's not done with Elijah yet. And he calls him forward into the next season. He says, go and anoint these kings for my purposes. Jehu would eventually, King Jehu would eventually succeed Ahab and Jezebel, who had been leading the people of Israel into idolatry. And then anoint a man, Elisha, to succeed him as prophet. And with Elisha, we notice that God also here gives Elijah a buddy. He's not calling Elijah to go alone. He sends him with someone else on mission. Elijah is called to anoint Elisha and then bring him along as he walks out the calling that God has placed on his life. And then he reminds Elijah Elijah of the truth. God is at work in his people and Elijah is not alone. Not only is God with Elijah, but there are many others who are following the Lord as well. Did you notice the Lord said that he had reserved 7,000 who had not yet bowed the knee to the false god Baal? So there's a bunch of Israelites who were still faithful to God and who had not followed Ahab and Jezebel into idolatry. And remember, Elijah thought that everybody had. But God tells him the truth. 
And Elijah goes on to continue living with God for his purposes, and he's not alone as he goes. God goes with him and gives Elijah companions for the journey. And y'all, God is the same God today as he was ministering to Elijah in his season of loneliness and depression. And we will all go through periods. We will. We live in a fallen and broken world, and we're waiting for the return of our king. But we'll feel alone. We'll feel defeated, and we'll feel dejected. But God is just as good now as he was when he was ministering to Elijah then. And so, family, let's talk about God's reset for us. After giving his life for our sins and rising again, Jesus gave his disciples a mission as well, the Great Commission. God gave Elijah a mission. We have received one too. The call to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them the ways of Jesus' flourishing, abundant kingdom. And church, listen, you don't go on this mission alone. You have brothers and sisters in Christ right here in this church family. I'm going to say this a couple of times. We get to go on this mission together. I'm going to say that again. We get to go on this mission together. We get to love one another. We get to deeply know one another. We get to support one another and care for one another as we live our lives for Jesus. And the best way to grow in relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ is to do life with them. Not just on Sunday mornings. Not just on Sunday mornings, but throughout the week. And family, that's why we have life groups here. That's why we have opportunities to gather with brothers and sisters, not just on Sunday, but on Tuesday and Wednesday and all throughout the week, because we are meant to do this together, to walk with one another. And those are places where you can be deeply known and loved and cared for. And so if you're not in a life group yet, I want to give you this. Get into a life group. I know that it can be intimidating. And I know that people are messy. I get it. But I also want to say this. Can I just tell you from personal experience that there have been times and places where I have been seen and known and loved when I was not okay. When I was not okay. And people saw me and they loved on me and they pointed me to Jesus. And they, in those times when you are feeling that and experiencing that, you do not have to go through that alone. You can receive love from God, your heavenly Father, and from God's people. And that's on offer for you. So I strongly encourage that. And follower of Jesus, I just want to remind us, because sometimes we can get so singular in our focus, we just need a, a reset of our view. We are part of a big story that God is writing We are part of this big story. You are part of something far bigger than just our local church family. You are a part of Christ's body, God's family, the church, the capital C church that's followers of Jesus all over the globe. God is at work in his people everywhere in the world to advance his kingdom, and you are part of that. Don't forget that. God's at work right now. Finally, and most importantly, family, Remember these words of Jesus to his disciples at the end of the Great Commission. This is from Matthew 28, 20. As I read it, Joe, would you come up? Sorry, man. (laughs) Matthew 28, 20. Jesus says these words to his disciples after he's given the Great Commission. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Follower of Jesus, there is no time that God is not with you. When you gave your life to Jesus, when you trusted in Jesus as Savior and Lord, His Spirit came to live in you. In the big and the small, God is there. God is there. And one day, church, one day at the end of the age, Our king is going to come back. And family, we are going to see Jesus face to face. Face to face. Never to experience loneliness again. 
And if you aren't yet following Jesus, I want you to know that he came and gave his life for you and for your sins so that you could be reconciled to God, so that you could know him, so that you could experience and delight in this deep connection with God that you ache for because you were made for it. You were made to know God. And so the invitation is before you today. Give your life to Jesus. Declare that he is Lord. Declare that he is your Savior and trust in him for the forgiveness of your sins and the reconciliation with the Father. You'll be welcomed into the family of God. You'll be a beloved son or daughter, never to be truly alone ever again because God will be with you. That's the good news of Jesus. That's our king. That's who we follow. That's who we love. Family, isn't it so good to know that we will never be truly alone? Because our God is here. And he's with each and every one of you. In response to God's word today, we always want to offer a next step. So I just want you to look up at the screens here. Pull out a next step card from your seat backs in front of you. Type it on your phone. Take a picture of it any and every way that you can remember it. Set it as your phone background. All the things. But the next step is to spend five minutes a day talking to God. Five minutes a day talking to God. I guess that's not on the screens. That's okay. Um, The next step is spend five minutes a day talking to God. Now, I've said this before, I'll say it again, that is a floor. (laughs) Because that conversation with the Lord may turn into a 30-minute gush fest. (laughs) Talking to Him, hearing from Him, connecting with Him in deeper and deeper ways. Intimacy with God is awaiting you, family, deeper and deeper than you've known it before. And maybe as you're speaking with the Lord, He may guide you into deeper community. He may guide you into a life group. He may guide you into confiding in a friend the way that you're feeling. He may guide you into deeper connection with those around you as well. Our God is so good, family. He loves us so much. Would you pray with me?